Okay, I'll no, no, no problem. Take your time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But uh, will you check the things whether it's working or sure, it's okay? I, I, it? Yeah. Uh, I I think it should be okay. I, I'll I'll. Okay. If you wish, I can just test it. Okay. Okay. You're seeing, yeah, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. It is okay. 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 Then we'll start. Okay. So good afternoon to all of the participants, particularly uh, my teachers, my colleagues, my friends, and my dear and beloved students who are participating in this uh, lecture series. We'll have uh, several lectures in this uh, series, and it is obviously we have chosen this uh, lecture series because to upgrade our knowledge in terms not only of the chemistry but also. since there are a lot of topics that are multidisciplinary where the physics chemistry math as well as biology are involved so that's what i taken this initiative to, mm -hmm. by inspiring from our uh, tic dr pijush kanti dandapat although he is unable to attend today because of a very urgent official work so i'm <clears throat> just conveying his message that he have given a good luck to all the students and he have message that the enrichment of knowledge and the idea and the topics should be workful in future so that our students can get benefited from this lecture series so thank you i thanks to our tic and the program chairman dr piyush kanti dandapat for his message and also our gb president and he is also also mla of this area uh, mr ardendu maiti he is uh, the uh chief patron of this program he is also conveyed our best wishes from his term so i thanks to him as well so with this uh, short description uh, today i am welcoming all all of you to this lecture series and we are very much fortunate that uh, among us we have today professor dp radhakrishnan who is a very senior uh, professor in hyderabad university is uh, working there for more than 30 years and lot of phd students more than i think uh, 20 phd students come up from his lab and they have joined in many good institution around the uh, india uh, many of are uh, very well known also and they are working very good and many of them are good my friends as well and he have uh, particularly expressed in many fields in particularly material science but also he is not limited himself in the material science his work also extended to the organic synthetic part as well and that is very surprising because most of the material chemist does not take part in the organic synthesis but he is expressed also extended to the other field of inorganic and organic he is also worked on the biological field as well nowadays uh, he is very much busy with uh, nano and nano materials and they are used in various fields including the biology and i am also very much fortunate that uh, i spend certain time in vicinity of the people like uh, professor tp radhakrishnan and i got chance to enrich myself in many field that also includes the crystallography we had many discussions regarding this and so that's what uh, i requested uh, our professor my teacher to share his views particularly in this area to my students as well such that the enrichment i have received from him that also will be extended to my students and other fraternity of this area so with this very short description because i am not really uh, very much uh, suitable to define through my words to the knowledge and expertise uh, professor tv radhakrishnan sir have so i have very short introduction but his introductions have many pages or maybe i can say a book so that cannot be ended with this short time so without uh, wasting a uh, lot of time i'll now request my teacher uh, my uh, guide my uh, everything i can say that my professor uh, uh, dr radhakrishnan i so i'll now hand over this uh, session to professor radhakrishnan sir please okay before i put my presentation let me first thank uh, dr sunirban das 
uh, for uh, asking me to do this, which is a very good, very pleasant duty for me to talk to students. In fact, our whole life is committed to uh, mentoring students and not only teaching, but learning from them. Because I think as a teacher, the uh, process of learning continues all through your life. Uh, student life gets over technically when you get your degree and so on. But if you continue to be a teacher, then you continue to be a student. So uh, I am telling this because I will be very happy to take questions from you uh, during this talk or at the end of the talk, or if time is not sufficient, uh, I more than encourage all of you to write to me through email. I give the email address in the very beginning. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to try and correspond with you and uh, try to learn from each other. Um, and I should mention that because this is this online mode is a little uh, impersonal. I don't see the face of all of you. Uh, so I will be going on talking. If there is any interruption anywhere, please inform me. Otherwise, I will not know. You can just uh, tell me and I hope I'll hear. I hope you can hear me so far clearly. Yes, sir. Is it clear? Yeah. Okay, just one second. My phone is ringing. Uh, okay. So, um, I'll share the presentation now and uh, continue to talk. If there is any issues, any problems, please uh, stop me. Feel free to do that. OK, so, um, so this is my title slide. So as uh, requested by Dr. Das, I will talk about X-ray diffraction and crystal structure. Uh, try to give a feel of what this means and try to be as um, rigorous as possible within this uh, small one hour lecture. And I have given here uh, my email address and my web link for my research group and so on. So if anybody in this audience, feel free to write to this address if you have any queries which you are not able to clarify during this session. So let me get started. So these are just some pictures of crystals. Could be any crystal, copper sulfate or whatever it is, some crystal. And the idea is that you try to get to see how the atoms are connected here. This structure is not necessarily for this crystal, but I'm just giving as an example. A crystal is connected to its structure. Now, that connection is very important because it gives a very precise, crystallography is one of the most precise techniques in the sense it tells you exactly where the atoms or molecules in a solid material are, in a crystal are. And there is practically no other method except very high resolution microscopy today, which can give you that information. But the high resolution microscopy is highly restricted to extremely well formed samples and so on. But the crystallography is much more prevalent. Many people can use it more easily. And why is it important to know the position of atoms and molecules in materials? Because that gives you the understanding of matter and its properties. Because to understand any matter or its property, you need to understand how the atoms or molecules are connected together. And crystallography is one of the most popular, the most well-established and precise technique for that. And much more than all this, these are, this is, of course, from a practical viewpoint of what I'm saying. But even from a conceptual point of view, X-ray scattering is an extremely elegant technique. Elegant means beautiful technique. The concept is fundamental, and it's very, very important. And it's not like you know, microscopy. Microscopy is more direct. That means you have an object, you magnify it somehow, and you see it. But X-ray scattering and X-ray diffraction is a slightly more technically involved uh, methodology. And how it leads to such precise information about the atoms is what I try to convey in a sort of a philosophical way during this talk. 
but looking at individual details as well. So the basic process is the following. So you have a crystal. Now you hit it with an X-ray beam, and then a lot of scattering happens. The X-rays are scattered by the crystal because the crystal is made up of very organized layers of atoms, and these organized layers act like a diffraction grating. So depending on the wavelength and the angle at which it is falling on these, and the composition of those planes, you will get a different intensities of this. This is just a schematic diagram, very intense. Some of the directions, it may be very intense, some may be very weak in between and so on. And you can collect these in what are called the diffraction patterns. So you can do this at different angles because you put different angles, you get the, the scattering from different planes of atoms. And then it goes through the, what is called a Fourier synthesis. This is the most critical, and this was the most revolutionary thing that happened to understand crystallography in the early part of the last century. So the Fourier synthesis converts these maps of these diffraction patterns into the crystal structure. So this is essentially the whole process in a very schematic way. Now, who did this? Obviously, this is again a very romantic concept because very unusual in the history of science that the father and the son jointly won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of crystallography. And that was done in 1915. And so we often talk about Bragg's law. So Bragg is actually not one individual, there are two very famous Braggs. The father was primarily the person who developed experimental technique. The son was the person who actually conceptualized and found out the idea of Fourier synthesis, converting it into structure and so on. So they together won the prize, one of the classic histories. In fact, the first crystal they did was sodium chloride, um, our, our common salt, as we call it or rock salt. Now, this being sort of a very brief, quick introduction to what crystallography is about and what historically, how relevant it is. Now, technically, what I'll try to cover is what I've shown here. I'll talk about crystals because that is our main uh, focus of interest, idea of symmetry and lattices and planes and so on, which Miller planes, for example, you start reading in high school days. Then we have to understand what waves are, and X-rays are waves, so what are waves? And not only X-ray diffraction, the same concept can be extended to electron waves or neutron waves and so on and so forth. So any wave, there are some fundamental principles of how the waves can add and subtract and so on. So once we understand what are crystals, what are waves, it directly gives you the famous Bragg's law. And then we can go into the more technical aspects of what are diffraction techniques and what is the meaning of systematic absence of how do you very, very briefly, these are extremely specialized subjects. And I am also not a, um, an expert crystallographer, so I cannot go into very great details about the resolution, structure solution, and so on. In fact, Dr. Das probably will know more about crystallography and crystal structure solution and so on than I do. And finally, if time permitting, I will just hint at what is an exotic idea called quasi-crystals. So let us begin with crystals. This is a picture of a, a piece of salt. This is the crystal structure, as I showed you earlier. Of course, a crystal can be made up of atoms and ions or molecules. This is, again, another crystal of some molecules. Now, what is important is these crystals are all packed with atoms or molecules in three dimensions. So we have to, we can imagine the crystal structure to be built up of atoms and molecules connected together in a three-dimensional space. But indeed, today, to, to explain this concept, sometimes two-dimensional crystals are very easy to understand. But And when one could raise the question, are there some things like two-dimensional crystals? Yes, there are. This is actually a picture from what is called a scanning tunneling microscopy. This is actually not from diffraction technique, but from actual microscopy. Today, it is so well advanced, the techniques, and this is already quite an old paper. You can actually see individual molecules. These are the actual molecules of some particular uh, uh, molecule which are having long alkyl chains and so on. And they are actually uh, sort of formed on a surface of a crystal, a very flat crystal surface. So these actually these molecules form a very ordered lattice structure. So this is like a, what a two-dimensional crystal would really look like. So I use this idea of a two-dimensional crystal to to develop the idea of a structure, order, and so on. So this is basically what is called a two-dimensional square lattice. 
what does it mean? That means if I take the nearest neighboring lattice points, by the way, these circles are not atoms, okay? They are not molecules, they are not atoms. They are just coordinates. That means their positions. For example, if I give this the position coordinate 0, 0, this will have position coordinate 1, 0. This will have 1, 1. This will be 0, 1. This will be 0, 2. This will be 1, 2, and so on and so forth. So these are basically addresses or coordinates in space. Since these nearby things form a square, we will call it a square lattice. Now, if you look at these lattices of various kinds, square lattice is one example. I'll show you various other kinds of lattices as we go along. They can have various symmetries, and I'm not very sure whether you have learned already what are called point group symmetries and so on. But uh, talking about this in great detail will take enormous time. So I will run through it, and those who are not familiar will need to do a little bit of reading up later on. There are a lot of paper, textbooks, and so on on group, group theory. And point group symmetries, these are the fundamental point group symmetries. Just to give an idea what some of these things mean. For example, reflection. Um, ammonia is a molecule which is familiar to all of you. So if you take a molecule like ammonia, you can imagine a plane like this, in which the, this sort of the front side and the back side uh, can be reflected into each other. For example, this nitrogen and hydrogen are in the plane, and this hydrogen is in the front, that hydrogen is at the back, so if I were to take this molecule and imagine a, a plane here, then you can reflect the whole molecule on that and you will see the molecule doesn't change at all. This hydrogen will come to the front and this will go to the back. The molecule will look identical. So this is a reflection plane. Similarly, you can have an axis of rotation. For example, this is a threefold rotation. That means 120 degree. It is 120 degree. If you do three times, it will become 360. So if you imagine this molecule rotated about this axis, you can see this hydrogen will come here, this hydrogen will go there, that hydrogen will come here, nitrogen remains where it is, and the molecule looks identical. So these are the ideas of symmetry operations. You can, of course, combine two symmetry operations, like, for example, rotation and reflection can be combined to form what is called an improper rotation. You can combine multiple reflections to create what is called inversion and so on. So there is a whole lot of things one can talk about. But since this talk is not primarily about this alone, I will go further. And I suggest those who are not familiar with this can look at some of these things. There is plenty of literature on the web now or textbooks and so on. But coming back to crystals, what is important is these are point group symmetries are molecular operations where at least one point in space does not move during any of these symmetry operations. For example, you notice here, when I do a reflection, nitrogen doesn't change its position. During rotation, nitrogen doesn't change. So there is one point which is preserved through all the symmetry operations. That is why these are called point group operations. However, in crystals, you have an additional symmetry, which is called translation, where every point in the material or in the crystal will move. And I will tell you what it looks like. So there is a, why, what is important about crystal symmetry is that in addition to this, you have translation operations. And you can, because of this translation operation, very interestingly, the so-called rotation operations, these kinds of rotations are very limited. You can have only certain particular types of rotations in a crystal lattice. In a molecule, you can have rotations of any order. This N is the order. For example, this is C3. If you take, say, for example, if you take a molecule like ethylene, you have two-fold rotation. If you took, uh, say, something like um, methane, you have three-fold rotations and two-fold rotations and so on. If you took a square planar metal complex, you have four-fold rotation. You can have various kinds of rotation. Benzene will have six-fold rotation. If you take cyclopentadienyl anion, five-member ring, you can have five-fold rotation. So you can have any kind of order of rotation for a molecule, but not so in a crystal. Crystal will, is allowed to have only certain specific values of n. What they are, I'm going to come to that very soon. So what is translation? Imagine this is a periodic lattice, and this is, I have drawn it as a, uh, because of the page restriction, it, it will in principle go on forever, this way, that way, and this way, and so on. Now imagine that I'm moving the whole crystal, or this lattice, through exactly this distance, from one point to the other. And I'm going to do that. In fact, I did it. I moved the whole lattice, but you did not see any difference, because every point this point went here, this point went here, this, this point went here, and so on. 
so you will not see any change so this is a symmetry operation how do you know that i have moved okay one way to do that is if i color some particular points when i move them you will see the color wing so this is basically a translation operation so a translation operation is a symmetry operation now because of this translation operation and these rotations that you can have will become restricted for example here i show the picture of a square lattice in fact if i rotate it by 90 degree and again i have to color it to see that i have rotated it this is what will happen it would have rotated through 90 degree you can again rotate it and so on so there is a four fold rotation possible which is again a symmetry operation here now the question is can i have any kind of rotation or as i mentioned earlier only specific kinds of rotation to prove this there is a very simple geometric proof one can develop restriction on the n fold rotation that means you can have only certain types of rotation this is extremely important because this is fundamental to crystallography if any kind of rotation was possible uh, then infinite number of symmetries are possible in crystals and there is no way we can solve a crystal structure but because the number of rotations are very finite possible rotations there are finite number of symmetries that any crystal can belong to and that is what enables us to do a crystal structure determination so it's a very fundamentally important point so imagine there are two lattice points and the distance between them is a now if there was a rotation of x angle theta possible then it is definitely possible that this point will come here during that rotation and this distance will remain a now if it is possible to do rotation clockwise it can also happen in anti clockwise direction so you will have another lattice point now comes the interesting question what will be the distance between these two lattice points because this is a trapezium by simple planar plane geometry you can prove that these two will be parallel and this because this distance in this direction of the lattice is a this distance has to be a multiple of a otherwise you will never get a periodic structure because even this when you do a translation this point will come here and this point to here it should be a multiple it should be one two three four five times a some multiple of a if it is not a multiple then this point will end up somewhere here rather than here therefore it has to be a multiple of a now given this geometry you can do a simple trigonometric calculation you drop a perpendicular you can calculate this distance will be basically na minus a there will be two such pieces here and here divided by two so this is n minus one a by two from this right angle sorry triangle you can easily show that this this angle this this angle here is 180 minus theta so cosine of 180 minus theta will be based by hypotenuse that is n minus 1 a by 2 divided by a that is n minus 1 by 2 so cos 180 minus theta is minus cos theta now this is a very important and fundamental observation what does this mean that means this theta is going to be controlled by or n or n is going to be controlled by theta now what are the possible values you can immediately see if i took assumed that any value of n is 5 let us assume an integer so what will be the value of this? It will be 5 minus 1 by 2. That will be 4 by 2. It will be 2. Cos theta cannot become 2. Cos theta by definition can oscillate from minus 1 to plus 1 and back. So the maximum value my cos theta can take is plus 1 and minimum is minus 1. So you, you cannot have a value 5. 4, it's not possible because 4 minus 1 by 2 is 3 by 2. Again, not possible. So the first starting point for n will be 3. So if it is 3, 3 minus 1 by 2 is 2 by 2 is equal to 1. So cos theta, theta will be equal to, uh, basically you can work out, it will be basically equal to 180 degree. And if theta is 180 degrees, the rotation will correspond to a rotation of, uh, order of rotation 2. Now you can take n equal to 2, n equal to 1, n equal to 0, and so on, and work out correspondingly the rotation order. And finally, when n equal to minus 1, that means this point is going towards this side, okay? So in this direction, you will get minus 2 by 2, you can still get cos theta is equal to 1 and therefore theta is equal to 0 and so on. Now suppose you go to minus 2, what happens? It will become again minus 3 by 2, impossible because cos theta cannot become 3 by 2. So now you see the rotations can only be 1, 2, 3, 4 and 6. Now this is a fundamental, fundamentally important point. So in a crystal which is periodic st structure, translationally periodic, you can have translational periodicity, you can have reflections, you can have rotations, but of order 1, 2, 3, 4, and 6, and nothing more. 
At the very end, please remember, I will briefly mention what are called quasi-crystals, which violate this principle. And that has developed into a new area of crystallography, but we will touch, it, touch upon it at the very end, very briefly. It's a mathematically complex issue, but I will briefly mention it at that point. But all the regular crystallography is confined to these kinds of rotation symmetries. Now, you can, of course, as I mentioned earlier, you can combine translation with rotation. That gives you what is called a screw axis. Translation with reflection, glide plane. These are all symmetry operations which are possible in a crystal, but never in a molecule, because molecules don't have translational symmetry. Now, just to quickly give you what are these, uh, what is the meaning of these two things, because these are very important in crystallography. A screw axis, I'll just give you a, a schematic diagram to illustrate that. Suppose there is a molecule here in the crystal, then there will be one at exactly, let us say, at one third along this, this is a, a particular unit cell axis, and move a little distance along this, and at the same time rotate it. It's basically like a screw. How does a screw move? When you're rotating it, the screw moves. So exactly this point here rotates by 120 degree and translates at the same time. So that is why it's called rotation plus translation. If you do the same operation again, you will move another one third of the axis. Rotation happens another 120, one more, and you will end up basically at exactly the same position here. So these are translationally periodic, and these are basically related by a screw rotation. So this is basically a total length of x, and this is called a 3-1 axis. Basically, the, the, this is a notation, which I'll explain what it means. Similarly, you can have a 2-1 axis and so on. What a CN screw axis means is you will be having a combination of a C rotation of a particular angle and n-fold rotation, and I should have mentioned CN rotation and n by C translation. So basically, that is exactly what, you, what will move this small, it should have been a, uh, okay. It's basically a C rotation by N by C translation. Basically, for example, in this case, it's a rotation of 120 degree and one third of the crystal axis and so on and so forth. So essentially, this gives rise to a screw axis. Similarly, you can have a glide plane. For example, there is a plane here. Simple mirror plane would have some object here and reflected along that plane. But a glide plane means you have an object here and it will be reflected along with the translation. You can see this is below the plane and there is a translation. So if there is a molecule here and the same molecule with a reflection below the plane and moved, and then that means there is a, this is a glide operation. Similarly, again, one more of that same kind of translation and reflection will, you, will bring you back to this translationally periodic uh, moiety here. So this is basically a glide plane, and this is simply called an X glide plane. So you can have glide planes along the A axis, B axis, C axis, and so on and so forth. So these are additional symmetries which are new in crystals. And these are, uh, I know for people who are hearing this for the first time, this may sound a little complex, but there is no other way to introduce it at the moment in a brief lecture like this. In principle, one should spend one hour class for each of these things. We don't have a luxury for that right now. So let me just run through this concept, and you can always refer back to this and try to learn little by little further. So moving on, now, now considering this, all these possible symmetries, that is, you have rotations and reflections and, of course, translations, if I were to look at two-dimensional lattice, then you can have a particular only very few specific kinds of systems which are possible. For example, you can have a lattice where the lattice point moves along a particular axis and another axis because this is a 2D lattice. And this can go on adding points like this, develop into a lattice. Please remember again, these circles represent points in space, no molecule or atom yet. We are going to bring the atoms and molecules and place them on these points later on. So this provides basically what is called a, a cubic a square, square lattice because basically the symmetry is that of a square, because you have four-fold rotation, you have reflection planes, you have, uh, uh, say, glide planes, you have uh, screw rotations, all kinds of possible um, uh, symmetries are there in this square lattice. You can, of course, distort it slightly. Suppose you pull it in one direction and uh, this distance is different from this distance, then you have what is called a rectangular lattice. But again, you can see it is periodic, but it does not have a four-fold rotation. It may look like a fourfold, but please remember this is actually a rectangle, not a square. 
So this distance is not same as this. So it, it loses a rotation symmetry, a fourfold rotation. It has twofold rotation. You can have what is called a hexagonal lattice. You can have you can see a hexagonal symmetry around this. Around this point, you can rotate it by a 60 degree, and the whole crystal will look identical. You can finally have a very low symmetry system called an oblique system where there is practically very little symmetry. There are no planes of symmetry here and so on and so forth. Uh, so you basically will have mostly a translational periodic uh, system here. Now, you, you can imagine this, look at these uh, structures using various kinds of uh, uh, relation between these unit cell directions. For example, an oblique lattice, you have a distance here A and a distance along this called B, which are not equal. And the angle between them is not equal to 90. Whereas a rectangular lattice, this A and B are not equal, but this angle is 90. And uh, a square lattice is A and B are equal. That means it is like a square and the angle is 90. And a hexagonal lattice is basically where A and B are equal, but this angle is exactly 120 degree. So this form, what are called the basic crystal systems in two dimension. Now, if you imagine any other kind of uh, periodic structure system like this in two dimension, you can show somehow that all of them will belong to one of these four crystal systems. You cannot imagine something completely different. However, there is one point, these are all having certain particular symmetries, so, you know, rotation symmetry and reflection symmetry and so on and so forth, which are different for each set of them. Now, if you translate this idea into three dimension, you can actually come up with seven such systems, which are called crystal systems in three dimensions. The cubic system, tetragonal system, and again, you can write relationships for them, which, okay, sorry. Uh, for example, here A and A and A are all equal here. These two are equal, this is different. Here in rhombic, these three are different, but all the angles are 90, and so on and so forth. So you, these points and the vertices are forming the lattice. So this is only a one unit cell, but you have to imagine the lattice will be these kinds of points extending into space along all the three directions. So these are basically what are called the crystal systems in three dimensions. Now, these are basically having a certain specific kinds of point group operations, like rotations and reflections and so on. Now, once you add a translation, you can show that in addition to these four in the two dimension, you can have one more kind of lattice. And what is that? That is looks very much like the rectangular, but has one more lattice point at the center of each rectangle. Now, what is this is called a center rectangular. What is what is interesting about this is the following. Now, if you look at the rectangular and center rectangular, they have identical set of point group symmetry operations. For example, this has a two-fold rotation, mirror plane, mirror plane, and so on. This has also two-fold rotation, mirror plane, mirror plane, etc. But in addition, this has what is called a translational symmetry along this direction, this direction here. Why? Because if I imagine this low lattice moving along a particular vector defined by a small arrow here, this point will come here, this point will come here, this will come here, and so on, the crystal will look exactly identical. Such a translation operation does not exist here. So this has one additional translational operation. And that is why this is called a separate lattice compared to this. It's the same crystal system, rectangular, but the lattice, which is called a Bravois lattice, named after the famous person who counted them, this is a slight, is a different Bravois lattice compared to this, because this has a little additional translational symmetry compared to the rectangular. And this is what this picture shows. This has these two as the unit vectors, but here you can choose this as the unit vector to develop this whole crystal lattice. That means by moving a lattice along any two or multiples of these two vectors, you can generate the whole lattice. That is why they are called primitive lattice vectors. Similarly, you can draw lattice vectors for all these other lattices. If you translate this idea into uh, three-dimensional lattices, you generate the famous body-centered cubic, face-centered cubic, primitive cubic, and so on. So these are basically cubic systems from the crystal system, all are cubic. Again, I call attention to the point that if you look at the point group symmetries, all these three have identical sets of point group symmetries. They belong to the point group called OH or octahedral point group. Now, if you look at the translational sy symmetries, these have 
different translation symmetry. This, for example, you can body centered cube, for example, translation along half the body diagonal is a symmetry operation, which this does not have. This does not have. Here along the face diagonal, if you take a half translation, this will be a symmetry operation that this lattice will have. So these are three distinct bravi lattices in three dimension. And if you extend this analogy to the various seven crystal systems, you will generate what are called the 14 bravi lattices. Now, these are very fundamental classifications of crystallography. That means any normal crystal that you can imagine in this world, if you do the analysis, it will belong to one of these 14 bravi lattices. It cannot be something outside these 14 bravi lattices. And please remember, this finite number 14 came because of that possibility of rotations being limited in a translational system. If you could have five-fold and eight-fold and nine-fold rotations, you would have a lot more bravi lattices, and there is no way you can classify them, and no way you can determine a crystal structure. Now, moving on, at this point, what we know is there are basically all crystals can be classified in, in terms of crystal systems, in terms of point group operations, into seven systems. These are for 3D crystals. And if you add a translational symmetry, you will have 14 bravi lattices. Now we add one more complication to the whole story. So far, I mentioned repeatedly that these circles are representing lattice. That means they are coordinates in space, or you can designate them with some coordinates. Now, in a real crystal, you have atoms and molecules. They occupy specific points. Those specific points are these. And where are the atoms and molecules? I have put in some atoms at each point, which I call X. And the technical name for them is a basis. So this lattice plus basis is basically what we call a crystal structure. So the actual crystal structure can be defined using a set of coordinates or points in space at which you place an atom or an ion or a molecule and so on. That molecule can be a very small, it can be a simple atom like a say iron atom or a copper atom or a sodium ion or chloride ion, or it can be a molecule like benzene or toluene or naphthalene or something or it can be even a huge protein molecule with hundreds of thousands of atoms uh, all being placed at each lattice point and you have a protein crystal. So what we place at lattice point is what we technically call a basis and the lattice plus this basis gives you the crystal structure. Now this basis is very important. Now suppose the basis is a spherical one, that means this is a lattice, this is an example of a square lattice which I showed you earlier. If the basis I am putting, the atoms I am putting are spheres, that means the atoms are ions, they are typically spheres. Or a molecule like fullerene, which is a spherical molecule, almost spherical. Then, after placing them, the crystal has the same symmetry as before. For example, the fourfold rotation still exists. However, if my basis is not a sphere, it's a molecule like, for example, naphthalene is not a spherical molecule or a benzene is not a spherical molecule. Now, if it is an ellipse, for example, ellipse, elliptical molecule, a non-spherical basis. Now, if I place them in a periodic lattice, now what happens to the C4 rotation axis of the lattice? It is gone. If you do a four-fold rotation, you get this. This is not a symmetry operation. So you have reduced the symmetry of the crystal by placing a non-spherical basis. So it's important to know whether, what are the subgroups of this uh, uh, square lattice you can generate when you place molecules or bases of a lower symmetry than a spherical one. In fact, they will all be point groups. Mathematically, they are point, sub subgroups of the original point group. In fact, you can see this square lattice has lost to the C4 axis. However, it has not lost to the C2 axis. You can do a 180 degree rotation. It will be a symmetry operation. So you still have some lower symmetry possible. So if you imagine, for example, a 2D square lattice, you can generate various kinds of, uh, depending on the type of molecules you put, you can generate various subgroups of that, which are called the various space groups. These are now called the space groups, which are essentially the, the point groups plus the various kinds of uh, lowering of symmetry due to the non-spherical base. Because in real life, in real crystals, you have molecules which are having lower symmetry than a sphere. So by placing them, you may get lower symmetries or subgroups of the original group. 
So if you go on doing this kind of an exercise for a two-dimensional lattice like that or three-dimensional lattice, for example, in cube, in the cube, depending on what you place at these cubic corners, you can have the full symmetry of a cube, OH, or you can have subgroups of O, this is called the rotational subgroup O, or you can have a tetrahedral, suppose, for example, on this you are placing some molecule which has uh, tetragonal kind of symmetry, then the whole subgroup of this OH, which is the TD group, will come out. So out of this, you can generate actually five subgroups. And these are called the points, cubic point groups. Now, if you do this exercise for all the 14 Bravai lattices, okay, this is the notations for these point groups and so on. These are very technical things. There are a lot of technical details in this, which I'm skipping. But concept is all that I'm trying to convey to today. Now, if I look back on my original table, which I had up to here, now imagine the lattice with the non-spherical basis and try to list all the subgroups for these seven crystal systems. If you were to place non-spherical basis and look list all the subgroups, you will come up with actually exactly 32 point groups. So these are called the 32 crystallographic point groups. Now out of the 14 Bravais lattice, that means with the crystal systems point groups, adding translation symmetry, we generated 14 Bravais lattice. If I imagined non-spherical molecules to be put at all the points, you will end up with 230 space groups. Now, this is a very holy number in crystallography. That means if I take any real crystal that I can make or you can make or anybody can make in this world, periodic structure, which is a crystal, and try to analyze its crystal structure, you will invariably find that it belongs to one of these 230 space groups. So that makes crystallography a possible uh, technique. That means when you actually determine the X-ray diffraction pattern, you can try to solve and understand that crystal structure as belonging to one of these 230 space groups and therefore determine the position of atoms and so on. So I know indeed that some of this may be a little confusing for some of you, but I'm just giving you the conceptual basis now to build on when you try to read further on this. Now, let us come back and quickly finish this discussion of crystals before we go to X-rays. Uh, let me see how we are doing on time. Okay, uh, not too well. I think I'm going a little slow. I'll try to go a little faster. <clears throat> so we have this lattice, and they, this is something that I think you are familiar with, so I'll go through rather quickly. So in a 2D, the Miller plane is essentially lines. In 3D, it will be basically planes. So these are called 1-0 uh, planes, basically, because they are intercepting this x-axis at, at uh, unit cell displacements of 1. And the distance between them will be distance A, that is the unit cell length. This will be called 0, 1 plane. You can have 1, 1 planes. I will go through this quickly because of my lack of time. And I think many of you may be familiar with it. I'll only give a specialized example. Not only 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, and so on. You can have more complex uh, Miller planes like this. For example, if you imagine these pink lines, Please remember this is an extended lattice. It will go on forever in the X and Y direction. So you will see that lines of atoms, the number of lattice points on these lines will become less and less, but on and you will see several points along this line and so on. So the distance between them, if you can calculate it using simple trigonometry, will become smaller and smaller. So what that means is as the Miller index increases, the distance between the planes will become smaller. So to name them, there is a standard method. You look at the intercepts. For example, here, these planes will, uh, will cut the unit cell at half along the x-axis, one third along the y-axis, and at infinity along the c-axis. So you take the inverse, you get 2, 3, 0, and that is the definition of the Miller plane. You can have two zero planes when there are atoms or lattice points coming between the one zero planes. This is called a two zero plane, and the distance between them will be exactly half of the one zero plane and so on. In 3D, of course, again, you have very similar idea. I will just run through it, one zero zero one one zero one 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 and so on. And using simple trigonometry, you can work out actually a relationship between the unit cell length and the distance between the plane. This is for a cubic system. For example, if I denote the Miller plane as H, K, and L as the indices, then the distance between the plane that is the perpendicular distance can be related to the unit cell distance using simple equation like this. For example, if it is one zero zero plane, this will be one plus zero plus zero, it will be a root of one, one, so dhkl will be a. 
if it is a 1, 1, 0, then it will be 1 plus 1 plus 0 root 2. So it will become a by root 2 will be the distance and so on and so forth. Similar thing, you can work out the relation between the distance between the planes and the unit cell parameters for various kinds of uh, unit cells. I think I probably skipped it. Let me just see. There was one more slide. Okay, that will come later. Okay, no problem. Similarly, for other crystal systems, you can have tetragonal systems and so on, similar relationships, which I will show you later on. Now, having discussed the idea of crystals, the symmetry, what are space groups, what are bravi lattices, in a very, very quick way, I, had, I agree, but at least given you a flavor of what it means, let us now move on to waves, because finally, for X-ray diffraction, the crystal has to be interacted with by waves, and the waves in particular today that we discuss is X-ray waves, and as I mentioned earlier, it could be neutron waves or electron waves and so on and so forth. So what are waves? Waves, mathematically or physically, is a very simple idea that you have an oscillating. It could be a field, basically mostly the electric field, which will be oscillating. So you have two important parameters called the phase. That means this point is called the zero phase. This is called pi, two pi, and so on. And as you change the phase, there is a displacement along the direction of propagation of the wave. And once it goes from phase zero to two pi, you would have moved a distance lambda, which is called the wavelength. This is half lambda and so on. So this wave can be represented using a simple function like sine function or a cos function. And this mathematically represents the time and position dependence of the We will skip the idea of time for the time being. So it will be simply two pi x by lambda. We'll represent this wave at any given instant in time. And lambda is the wavelength mu is the frequency that is if you have the time dependence also and a is the 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 amplitude for example here it is the a and here it will become zero here it will become zero again and so on so you can easily verify for example when this phase is pi or zero that zero pi two pi and so on the the amplitude will become zero and when the phase is as some half integer multiple of pi for example a pi by 2, 3 pi by 2, and so on, the, sign, the value of sine will go through plus 1 and minus 1 and so on. So this is a description of the wave. Now, why do we worry about this description of a wave? Because X-rays are waves, and when they hit the crystal, they are going to have interaction between the waves. This is called the superpositioning of waves. To understand that in a very, very simple diagrammatic way, I take one wave. And imagine another wave coming exactly in phase. That means when this phase is zero here, this is zero. When this is pi, it is pi. When it is two pi, it is two pi, and so on. Now, if you add the two, you will get a large wave with a double the amplitude. However, so this is basically called a constructive interference. The two waves are adding exactly when they are, because they are exactly in phase with each other. However, if I took one wave and moved the other wave, by a small displacement, lambda by four, because this is basically from here to here, it is lambda, so this is lambda by four. If I moved it, and now I try to add them, I will get an amplitude of 1.4a, not 2a. Now, how do I get this? this is a very simple trigonometric addition, which I, I can you can look at uh, later on. You can write out actually the sine function and add two sine functions, you will get this value, 1.4a. Now, if I took one more instance, that means I bring the second wave exactly half lambda displaced, then I will see that it will exactly cancel out with amplitude zero. This is called a destructive interference. Now, to summarize this, basically if I take a wave lambda, move it by distance x, and take another wave, which is moved by distance lambda by two, and a third wave, which is moved by distance lambda, I will get wave lamb one, two, and three, and clearly you can see one and two will destructively interfere, one and three will constructively interfere. One and three will constructively interfere because this wave actually you can imagine, there is a similar wave here, which is exactly adding to the first one. Now, this is basically Bragg's law. Now, what is Bragg's law? As many of you have already seen in your high school textbooks, basically if you have an X-ray wave coming, a red line is one wave, blue is another wave. Now, depending on the two, what is the difference between the two? Because these are the planes of crystals. Now we bring back our crystal planes here, HKL planes. So if I take these planes of crystals, which means on, along the plane you have many atoms, the basis, the X-rays will be scattered. 
the same x-ray beam which is coming, one wave will be scattered from plane one, one will be scattered from plane two. Obviously, the blue wave has traveled a little extra distance compared to the red one. And what is that extra distance? You can easily calculate it if you know the angle of incidence. That means if this wave is incident on the plane at an angle theta, you can easily show this angle here will be exactly theta. And this you can work out will be d times sine theta, where d is this distance. So d times sine theta will be this. So there are two such extra pieces the blue wave is traveling through. So the extra distance traveled by the blue is 2d sine theta. And if it happens to be exactly an integral multiple of lambda, the two will constructively interfere. That's all. That's Bragg's law. Now, that's a very simple law, but it's a very fundamentally important law. But one thing I should caution is that this law tells you very little about the crystal. It gives you some idea of the, the interplanar distances, but it says practically nothing about where the atoms are in these individual planes. So we will come to that issue very soon. So now that we understand what is the Bragg's law, that is good enough to do what is called a powder diffraction analysis. What is powder diffraction analysis? Imagine the crystal, you send an X-ray beam as I showed you earlier and it gets scattered. Now, if I take a collection of microcrystals, obviously these, uh, these beams which are coming out scattered, there are so many crystals in so many different orientations, the scattered beam will basically form a cone from a particular Miller plane, if it comes at a particular angle theta, then that angle, that theta will be coming at various directions. So it basically forms a cone. For each Miller plane, I will get a particular cone, a pink cone or a green cone and so on and so forth. Now I intersect it with a detector. So I will basically get on the detector uh, lines which are cutting the, the diffraction from different Miller planes. For a, for a single crystal, it is only single lines which come. For a collection of crystals, which is what is done in the powder diffraction experiment, you will get these cones of reflection. So this is how actually a powder diffractometer will look like. This is a schematic diagram. So you have a sample. You have an X-ray tube from which X-ray will come. The sample can be moved and rotated. There is a detector here, which again can be rotated. So it will basically, the X-ray scattering will be detected by a detector at different angles. And it will basically plot that data. So here it, it basically looks at this data. At different angles, there is an intensity of scattered X-ray coming out. So this is the famous diffraction pattern of sodium chloride. And if you remember it, I mentioned this was the first structure looked at by Bragg and Bragg. And you get these very nice sharp lines at specific angles. Now, why specific angles? Because only at that particular angle, it or it satisfies the Bragg's equation and you get strong X-ray scattering. At all other angles, there is no scattering and nothing comes out. Now, curiously, some are very weak, some are very strong, and there is something in between and so on and so forth. There's a lot of variation in the intensity. Now, the intensity contains a very important information, which we will look at a little bit later. For the time being, we will look at only one information. At what angle are these peaks coming? So I just list those angles here. This is a process called indexing. So I just list all the angles at which they came. This angle 2 theta is used, to, for example, I'll go back a minute just to show you. OK, uh, maybe this picture is good enough. The angle 2 theta is used normally because a beam comes and hits the sample. And you normally measure the angle of deviation from the incident beam. And that will be, actually one can geometrically show, will be two times the angle of the at angle at which it falls on a particular Miller plane. So it is basically experimentally you normally plot two theta, but to see the angle at which the beam has fallen on the Miller plane, you have to take half the two theta. That means theta. So basically you have two theta here. You take the angle uh, half of this, you will get theta values at which the Miller, the Bragg equation is satisfied. Now using this, wavelength of the x-ray which is known to us because we are running the experiment you can easily calculate the d the the, the, the miller plane distance because using that equation 2d sine theta is equal to n lambda and by the way we take it as one because even if you take two three four and so on it will correspond to some miller plane with a higher index so in in practice we always take n equal to one n equal to three corresponds to another miller plane with one third the distance of say a 100 plane, for example. So it is inbuilt into it. 
So it forget about n for the time being. So 2d theta is equal to lambda. So lambda is known and theta is known. So you can actually calculate d. Now, this is the only raw data from the experiment. Now, what do we do? Now, h, k, and l are integers. If you remember, I mentioned these are integer values. By definition, the Miller index is h, k, l. Now, in principle, it can start from 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, and so on and so forth as integers. Now, you go on trying different values of indices, integers, and try to use this equation like this. For example, this is the equation for cubic group. Now, if I take the various values of h, k, l, and knowing the value of d, I can calculate a. I go on doing this for various possible h, k, l values and various d's and you do an exercise to see if I will always get the same value of A. What does that mean? A is the unit cell parameter, and that's a fixed value for this particular crystal. For example, sodium chloride, there's a particular value for A. It, you cannot change that. So basically, this exercise involves trying out various integer values of HKL for the various D values until you get this equation leads to the same identical value of A. You can see within experimental error, these are all 5.63 or 5.64. Now, if you try the 100, you will get an entirely different number. So that will not be a valid Miller index. So this process, you can go on. Now you can ask the question, how do you know it is a cubic system? It may be a tetragonal system. For example, you can have for tetragonal, you have equations like this, where A and C are there for orthorhombic, for hexagonal, and so on. So you have different equations. So in this indexing process, you actually try out different crystal systems and the corresponding equations and try to see whether this data which you have, which is a raw data, experimental data, can be indexed to a certain set of Miller planes, yielding a unique set of unit cell parameters, A, B, C, or alpha, beta, gamma. So those are the six parameters which you will have in a triclinic system, the lowest symmetry system, or a single parameter A in cubic, which is the highest symmetry system. So you can basically finish this indexing. And once you do that indexing, you can actually uh, you can get a picture of which crystal system the crystal belongs to. In this particular case, sodium chloride nicely fits a cubic system. So immediately I can say, yes, sodium chloride belongs to a cubic system. But from textbook, we know that it is not only a cubic system, but it is also a face-centered cubic system. Now, this simple crystal indexing doesn't tell us whether it is a cubic, a primitive, or a face-centered cubic, or a body-centered cubic, unless we look at this important concept called systematic absence. Now, what is that? If I take a primitive cube, and I try to look at all the Miller, any crystal, if I have a primitive cubic structure, I will see reflections, the scattering coming from 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, and so on and so forth. However, if I take an FCC crystal, I will see that there are diffraction patterns coming only from uh, certain particular lines. For example, 111 one line is there, but 110 one and 100 zero zero will not be there. When I did the indexing, if you remember, I did not get these indices. I got 111, one one. I got 200. Zero zero. I did not get 210211, but I got 220, and so on. So there is a very unique fingerprint for this. And if you look at these numbers carefully, these conditions are present. H, K, and L are all even. That means all even or all odd. All three are odd here. All are even here. Here it is uh, two even and one odd, so it is missing, and so on and so forth. Similarly, in another case, if it is a BCC lattice, you will see the condition that some of these two, three should be should be even. If it is odd, it will be missing. Now, this looks like a very mysterious thing, but these are called systematic absences. It is not coming due to any particular type of atom present, but due to the symmetry of the crystal lattice. How do you know this? And how do you understand this meaning of systematic absence? Because by now looking at this pattern of the sodium chloride crystal, I can immediately tell not only does it belong to cubic system, but because of the systematic absences, it belongs to an FCC system, not a BCC. Now, the only thing I have not told you is why it happens to have these missing lines and why sodium chloride with an FCC lattice gives you only some particular condition for the uh, system and so on. So I can now 
come up to the level of not only crystal system, but also specify which bravi lattice it belongs to by doing a powder diffraction experiment. Now, that still doesn't tell me where these atoms and, sit, and molecules are sitting. Like an FCC lattice, where are the sodium ions? Where are the chloride ions? The powder diffraction experiment doesn't tell us fully. For that, we have to go one step further. We have to analyze the intensity of those things, that diffraction pattern I showed you. To understand that, please, we will look at very briefly of the, about the idea of the scattered X-ray intensities. Suppose there are multiple atoms in the basis. That means in the, in the crystal lattice, if you remember, we have a lattice and a basis. So the basis may consist of single atom, multiple atom, molecule, protein, molecule, and so on and so forth. So if there is more than one atom, let us assume for a simple case, two kinds of atoms, one and two, in the basis. For example, if it is a hydrogen chloride molecule, if I were to make a crystal of HCl by sufficiently cooling the gas, I will have two kinds of atoms in it, one and two. And the waves scattered from the different layers due to atoms one and two will have different phases because they are coming from different layers. And they will have different amplitudes because the two atoms are not same. And therefore, the intensity with which they are scattered will be different. The amplitude will be different. Why is that? The reason is, okay, sorry. The reason is the scattering. How does this actual scattering happen from an atom? It is basically the X-ray beam is an electric, electromagnetic radiation. And the atom is consisting primarily of an electron cloud, which is very large in, in volume compared to the nucleus. So the electron density is what actually counts here, not the, nu the nucleus. The electron density, higher the electron density, more efficiently it will scatter the X-ray beam. So an atom with a large atomic number will strongly scatter the X-ray. An atom with a very low atomic number will scatter very weakly. So that determines this amplitude. So now the main point is now we let us come back to this idea of two waves which are scattered from two types of atoms with different phases because they are lying on different planes and different amplitude because their two atoms are different. Now the two electric fields of these two, two waves, I can write it as A1 sine phi1 and A2 sine phi2. I can imagine uh, diagrammatically a wave one, wave two, because they are having different phase, they are moved with respect to each other. And because amplitudes are different, that the height, maximum heights are different, I can add the two. So actual experiment, what I record is wave three, not one or two, the total effect of it. Therefore, I have to explain, I have to describe the intensity of a scattered wave as coming from multiple atoms, from multiple waves, multiple planes. And I have to try and figure out what atoms are sitting on which plane. So mathematically, it becomes very easy to write this A sine phi wave as an exponential function, and this is commonly done. Uh, we need not worry about the details. So it is usually written in the amplitude and phase as an exponential function, A e to the power i phi. This is called the Eulerian uh, representation of this. And if I now define, I'll come back to this uh, exponential uh, form of this function a little bit later. I define two factors here, f, which is called a scattering factor of that atom which is basically the amplitude of the wave scattered by the atom by an and amplitude scattered by a single electron. So this is essentially what I mentioned earlier. An atom with more electrons will have a higher atomic scattering factor because it, there is more electron density. And now if I imagine the waves are scattered from, uh, by, with the different phases, I can write this equation. This can be actually derived. I've skipped that derivation for this lecture because it takes a little more time to do this. I can represent a new function, which is called the structure factor. What is the structure factor containing? It has two important information. One is this scattering factor. It determines what kind of atom you are uh, getting a, in, a reflection, a scattering of the X-ray from. And it also contains the phase information. The phase is basically determined by the position of the atom, X, Y, and Z, of the nth atom. So this summation runs over various n, which are the n atoms in the basis. A molecule like a diatomic will have two atoms. A, a, a protein molecule will have 100,000 atoms, maybe. So N will go from 1 to 100,000 for a protein. So essentially, the atom is placed at X, Y, Z. And the scattering factor of that atom is Fn. Then the intensity of the scattering from that H, K, L plane is given by this structure factor. So the structure factor, just to explain it again once more, what I mentioned earlier. So the structure factor is closely related 
to the, it is basically closely related to the electric field, not the intensity of the scattered X-ray due to atoms in the basis summed over n, that means n atoms at positions x, n, y, n, z, n, and with atom type Fn. So this F contains the atom type information, x, y, z as the atom position. So if I know which atom, a type atom, is present at which position, I have solved the crystal structure. So this structure factor contains all the information about the crystal structure. Now, the intensity is what is actually measured, not the electric fields. Electric fields are complex numbers. You cannot measure them. What you can do, measure is the, is the, the electric field multiplied by its complex conjugate, which is a real number, which is the intensity. So once you measure the intensity, there are some mathematical techniques to convert it into a structure factor, which is the, the field actually. And from that field, once you know the structure factor, you can build back the positions and types of atoms. So this is the process of what I originally called the Fourier synthesis. We will come to that in a minute. But just to quickly mention why this structure factor is important to understand the so-called uh, systematic absence. Uh, Dr. Das, shall I take another 10 minutes? Yeah, yeah, sure, sir. Okay, yeah, because I think I have reached 4 o'clock right now, but uh, I, I will need another 10 to 15 minutes probably, yeah. So now let me explain why that structure factor looks like a very complicated uh, equation and so on. And I told you phase and the atomic scattering factor, various terminologies. Now that is actually what is used in crystallography. But to illustrate the meaning of this, I will relate it to the idea of systematic absence. So the two mysteries that I skipped earlier, for example, in a BCC lattice, H plus K plus L has to be even. If it is odd, you will not see an intensity. Why? The answer comes by an analysis of the structure factor. How do you do it? It's a very simple example to take. So the structure factor for, let us assume there are two atoms in the, in the crystal. So this is the unit cell. So this is like how it will look like a body-centered cubic lattice, except I have colored the body center differently from the vertex. Please remember, in a real BCC, whatever atom is present here will be present at the body center. So we will come to that BCC lattice in a minute. But for the time being, let me treat this as a primitive simple cubic, uh, simple cubic lattice uh, with uh, one extra atom in the basis at this body center. So there are two types of atoms in the in the primitive cubic lattice. That means one red and one blue. You may think, what about this other red? Please remember, this red and the blue from the next cube will belong to the next unit cell. This red, sorry, this red atom and a corresponding blue will cor correspond to another unit cell here and so on. And this red atom and a blue atom here will be this unit cell above and so on. So within this unit cell, I have this red atom and a blue atom. So let me write the structure factor for this diatomic basis, a red atom and a blue atom. So red, let us assume, is at origin 0, 0, 0. Blue will be at half, 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 the coordinate. Why half, half, half? Because it is half along the x-axis, half along the y-axis, half along the z-axis. So this coordinate is half, half, half. It's called actually the fractional coordinate because it determines the fraction of the unit cell length. So 0, 0, 0, half, half, half. So this atom is at Fa into e to the power 2 pi into i into 0 plus 0 plus 0. So the exponential will be 1. At exponential to the power 0, so it will be 1. So it will be simply Fa. And for B, there will be some Fb. It's, it's atomic scattering factor with Hx, Ky, Lz where x, y, z are values are known. So let me substitute those values. So if I take this factor called the phase factor, 2 pi i into h, x plus k, y plus l, z, x, y, and z, I substitute half because this is like a BCC lattice. What will I get? I'll put half, half, half here. Half and two will cancel out. I'll get pi i into h plus k plus l. So the structure factor equation will be f a plus f b e to the power pi i into h plus k plus l. Now, this is a very interesting equation. Why? Because if h plus k plus l is even, then e to the power of an even multiple of pi, i pi, will be 1. It will be cos 2 pi plus i sine 2 pi, for example, will be 1. But if this number is odd, e to the power, for example, cos 3 pi i 
cos 3 pi plus i sin 3 pi will be minus 1. You can verify this from trigonometry. So whenever this summation is odd, this exponential will be minus 1. When it is even, it will be plus 1. Now what is the consequence of that? Please remember, as I mentioned, this blue atom is actually red atom. So I put these two different only to write this equation initially. So Fa and Fb are equal. That is what it means. So both are same atoms means both have same, same atomic scattering factor, F. If I put F as a common factor, so this equation will become F into 1 plus e to the power i pi into h plus k plus L. Depending on h plus k plus L is equal to even, that will be plus 1. So it will be 1 plus 1 in the bracket. It will become 2F. If it is odd, it will become 1 minus 1 in the bracket. So it will become 0. So this is a simple exercise to show you that when I have a symmetry of a body-centered cubic lattice, whenever the h plus k plus l is even, the structure factor will be finite. Whenever it is odd, it will become zero. Zero means intensity vanishes. This is called systematic absence. Now, it doesn't matter whether I have sodium atom and sodium atom here, or gold atom and gold atom here, or a protein molecule here and a protein molecule here, doesn't matter. It will they will all have the same F and therefore they will cancel out. Physically, what does it mean? It means the, the, the X-ray waves which are scattered by this set of planes containing this atom and the plane containing this atom will interfere destructively and make it vanish. Similarly, one can work out the systematic absence for FCC lattice, all the other Bravais lattices, 32, uh, the 14 Bravais lattices, sorry, the yeah, 14 Bravais lattices, you can work out these systematic absences. And later on, for all the 230 space groups, and it is all compiled in a big fat book called the Table of Crystallography and so on. So by just looking at the systematic absence, immediately one can assign which space group of the 230 the crystal will belong to. Now, I have answered several questions now, but not the important question of where are the atoms finally present. For that, you have to do the second last step in this the last step in this process called the single crystal structure, which is again a very technical um, subject. So I will not go into any great detail. I will only go through the quick steps in the last five to 10 minutes we have. There is a two essential parts to this called the structure solution and refinement. And just to, for a breather, just to give you some, to go away from uh, equations for a time being, <clears throat> few pictures. So this is how actual diffractometer looks like. This is, I think, one of the older diffractometers in our department. Sunirvan must have worked on it long time back, perhaps. So you basically have a, a microscope and uh, just to see, and this is an X-ray generator. There is a detector here. You mount a crystal somewhere in the middle of this point. It is mounted on a, a table, which is basically to mount the crystal. And there are essentially three important parts to this. One is the X-ray crystal mount, on which the crystal is fixed, and you can rotate the crystal to different positions. You have the X-ray source here, and you have the detector here. And oh, sorry, sorry, I think I mixed up between the two. This may be the this is the detector. Sorry, this is the X-ray source. Doesn't matter. They are all little boxes. So the X-ray source is basically an X-ray tube, and you have all seen the principle of X-ray. You basically have a cathode and an anode. The anode can be of different metals, uh, and from the cathode you eject uh, electron beams and they, it generates X-ray beams depending on the type of metal you have. You have different wavelengths of X-rays coming out and you need some cooling system and so on and so forth. So depending on the type of uh, metal you use here, you can get different. For example, you can have a copper, molybdenum, different kinds of uh, targets here and you will get different X-ray wavelengths. And this is called the goniometer on which you mount the crystal. So actually the crystal will be mounted somewhere here and this is a complicated and highly precise instrument where the crystal can be rotated through different angles called the, the, the omega angle, phi angle, chi angle, and so on. And the detector can be moved through various angles theta. So essentially, the idea is you mount a crystal, you send an X-ray beam, and you rotate the crystal to different positions to expose the different Miller planes in that and keep on collecting the intensity of the scattered X-ray. <clears throat> Excuse me. So essentially, you collect all these various uh, uh, X-ray beams, and then you <clears throat> uh, 
uh, okay, we have one small quick picture of the detector. Modern uh, X-ray diffractometers have what are called a CCD-based detector. If you remember a few years ago, the discovery of charge-coupled device was awarded the Nobel Prize and so on. Very important discovery because it makes the uh, data collection, in fact, many of your the mobile phones have CCD detectors today. Uh, and these are much more sensitive and more sophisticated CCD detectors. You basically, the X-ray scatters come, it generates some electrons and uh, it hits some fluorescent screen and it converts them into photons. They go through fiber optic cables and you have a detector here, which is the CCD detector. It is convert, converted into electrical signals and recorded and so on. So it's a very long process which happens here, but you get very precise information about the picture which I showed you in the very beginning those diffraction patterns are collected by this, and the diffraction patterns can be analyzed using the so-called Fourier synthesis. So I mentioned Fourier synthesis in the beginning. Fourier synthesis is simply a mathematical technique. You have all heard of Fourier analysis, and Fourier was one of the greatest mathematicians of all time. And the Fourier synthesis finds application in many, many fields of uh, computational work and uh, instrumentation today. Crystallography would not have happened at all had it not been for the mathematical technique of Fourier, um, synthesis, Fourier analysis or Fourier um, decomposition or Fourier transformation and so on. So this is the equation which I wrote earlier, structure factor related to the atomic scattering factor and position of atoms for a given plane HKL. It can be rewritten in a slightly different format using integrals instead of summation. This is commonly what is used where this is basically called a uh, uh, it's basically a, vec uh, uh, a K is a vector called a reciprocal lattice vector, which I will not go into details. And FR is basically the, uh, it is related to the scattering factor. It is essentially related to the electron density. If you remember, the scattering factor of the atom depends on the electron density. So this is basically electron density information. And this phase factor is represented by this product is basically a vector product of a real lattice vector, which is basically a vector which relates to a, lattice points in a real crystal and k is what is technically called a reciprocal lattice vector let us not worry about it uh, so this is basically the so-called Fourier transformation is to convert an integral like this to if sk is an integral of this function uh, in this space by Fourier transformation i can just transform space for example i can write what is this function fr in terms of this function sk e to the power minus ikr into dk. So I am integrating here in real space. Here it is integrated in reciprocal space. So this is the very crucial step in crystallography. So essentially in crystallography, this is what you measure, the structure factor. Actually, you measure intensity convert into structure factor, and you integrate it to get the electron density. So this process converts the structure factor, which is actually something and information in this space defined by this vector k, or it is called the reciprocal space, or those diffraction pattern which you showed, which I showed you, is basically a picture of the so-called reciprocal lattice. You convert that information into real lattice by this so-called Fourier transformation, and you what you get is an electron density map in real space. So in R is a space coordinate in real space. Without that, you will not know. Once you get the electron density map in real space, that indeed is your crystal structure. Because in real space, if I say there is a lot of electron density here, which I can add up to six electrons, then I can say there is a carbon atom there. If the electron density adds up to, to say 23 electrons, it will belong to whatever sodium or whatever, uh, sodium is 11, sorry, right? Atomic number, whatever. So depending on the atomic number, you will get the electron density there. Now. Depending on the electron density at different points, you can assign the atom there. So this map of this electron density is basically the structure solution. So the Fourier map, it is called a Fourier map, is essentially the electron density in three-dimensional space, which you obtain by Fourier transforming the structure factor. So now you have a structure solution. And in the real crystallography, actually you go through a, 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 what is called a refinement process. The steps are very briefly mentioned here. What you do is you take the structure factor map, structure factor data, do a Fourier synthesis, create a Fourier map, which is called the structure solution, which roughly tells you where the electron densities are corresponding to different atoms. So that initial solution you use 
to calculate a structure factor. That means you have you now roughly know where the carbon and nitrogen and oxygen atoms are. So you know the position of the atom, you know the type of atom, but you may not be very sure because carbon and nitrogen are so close in atomic number, you may mix up between the two. Because in the real experiment, you've got to get only electron density. If it comes out to be 6.2 electron density, then it could be carbon or it could be nitrogen with a lot of disorder, for example. So it could be various kinds of things. So you assume a solution, you calculate a structure factor because using this, if you remember this equation, I can calculate the structure. If I know the position of atom and the type of atom, I can calculate the structure factor. I calculate the structure factor now. So for each Miller plane scale, I have a calculated value. And for experiment has already given me for each scale an experiment. Now I try to see what is the correlation between the two. So I go on doing a least square refinement. That is called a structure refinement. So least square, basically what it does is it will compare the calculated structure factor and experimental structure factor and the correlation coefficient is called R factor. Now, if this correlation is not very good, I cannot do anything with the experimental data because that is fixed. But what I can do is the calculated value I can change by modifying the atom or its position. So I move the atom slightly this way, that way and so on. Of course, nowadays computer will do that and recalculate the structure factor and compare it again to this. Is it getting better? If it is getting better, then yes, your refinement is improved. You go on doing this until you hit a dead end. That means whatever I do for this position of atoms and atom distribution, I cannot get a better correlation with the SH scale. That means I've got the lowest uh, R factor or the best correlation possible. Mm -hmm. That particular model is our final uh, crystal structure. So this is essentially the story of crystallography. Mm -hmm. I, in a very short time, this is all that I think I can do to give you the basic idea of what is a crystal, what is a wave, what is the interaction between them, and the very critical issues of systematic absence, structure refinement, and so on. And just two slides. This is, of course, for an afterthought. It's a very advanced subject, <coughs> which many of the young students should know about. Even I don't understand the mathematical aspects of it. It is extremely complex. Yes. Uh, so what are quasi -crystals? This is a very interesting concept. <coughs> Now, hello, yeah. yeah. Long time ago, in 1984, there was an interesting discovery by a famous scientist called Schechtman. He found that in a particular alloy of aluminum, and he got some symmetry in the in these diffraction spots, tenfold symmetry, rotation. If you remember, I said it is impossible. He also knew it is impossible in a crystal, but it was very reproducible. And very soon, people find all kinds of interesting structures where you can have various kinds of symmetries, uh, octagonal, decagonal, dodecagonal, icosahedral, and so on. Somebody's mic is on. Yeah. OK, so then it turns out these are due to what are called periodic structures in a higher dimension. It is something that mathematically one can prove but physically very difficult to imagine. For example, in a in a something which is we have always talked about two-dimensional and three-dimensional space and translational periodicity. But if you can mathematically describe a five-dimensional space or a six-dimensional space, you can show that various kinds of higher order rotation symmetries are possible. Now, this was something unbelievable for a lot of people, and many people criticize saying there is something wrong in this. It took many, many years from 1984 for the community, scientific community to accept it, but finally it did. And this is the picture of now uh, Schechtman, who got a Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2011 for this discovery of quasi-crystals. So don't worry about it. It is not something which is normal crystals. It is unusual crystals with periodicity in higher dimensional space, mathematically provable, but apparently is practically some applications are coming out for these alloys and so on. Now, there is one more very interesting incident related to this. So I'll close this with this last slide. This is called Penrose tiling. You can see a picture here. This name Penrose, I don't know if any of you heard this year, very recently in the newspapers. Uh, this is Penrose. He got the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2020, just a few weeks back. For a discovery in relativity, he is a mathematical physicist, but he is also famous for this kind of patterns and these are exactly what quasi crystals are you can see beautiful patterns they are 
perfect. These are five fold symmetric patterns, you can see. However, they are non periodic. You don't see a periodic structure. You can see this and this are not related by periodic structures because five fold symmetry is impossible in a periodic structure. So these tilings, these are called tiling problem in mathematics. There's a lot of mathematics behind it. Penrose was famous for this. So this was a model that Schechtman and people used to understand the quasi crystals and develop the idea. So this is going a lot beyond our regular crystallography. But as young students, I think you should be aware of these. And these are not trivial. As you can see, these are all extremely interesting ideas. And I just mentioned Nobel Prize as a simple example of how profound these discoveries are. Not that all great discoveries are associated with Nobel Prize. There are great, great discoveries which are not. But this is also an interesting thing to aspire to for young students. So I will close here and thank you for your attention and take any questions you may have. OK. Uh, on behalf of our student fraternity and institution, I thanks to my teacher, Professor T.P. Radhakrishnan, for his uh, wonderful presentation. And I also admire to him. And also, I uh, agree with him, because this is a vast area. And this is really uh, very difficult to represent or maybe uh, reach to the student's mind about the knowledge of this vast area within an hour or so. But at least uh, what he have tried, and I admire uh, to him, that the real roots uh, where from this crystallography is came up and how this structural solution can be achieved, he have shown us the root. So I'll now with that, uh, I'll uh, request to our audience or students particularly, if they have some specific questions. So one or two questions we can take up because it's already very late. So and rest, if you have any questions, I'll share uh, with his uh, yeah. with the kind permission of Professor Radhakrishnan, his email uh, ID. Yeah. Yeah. Whenever you feel any question related to that one, so you can sure. ask him directly him in the mail. Hello, if you sir, have I any questions, cool. one or two questions we can take. Hello, sir. I am audible. Okay, speak. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can hear you. Yeah. Um, okay, I uh, can I solve the any structure. Uh, using paper X-ray diffraction or uh, any like of diffraction structure derivation of spectra, like using crystalline solid or amorphous solid, very using huge. But if we instead of use of any our pseudo solid can be applied to what happen, but what problem is arise in future? Uh, I didn't fully catch it. Uh, amorphous, you mentioned many terms. Amorphous materials obviously will not give a diffraction pattern. And uh, there is no way to uh, understand their structure using an X-ray diffraction technique. Uh, but uh, you mentioned spectroscopy. Spectroscopy, for example, can be used to understand the, the nature of groups present and so on. But the single crystal structure that I discussed today is possible only when you have a well-formed uh, single crystal. Now, depending on the type of uh, diffractometer you use, you can have um, very small crystals you can handle sometimes, very thin crystals can be handled, protein crystals with a huge number of molecules can be handled today. There are all kinds of improvements in the capability of X-ray diffractometers. But if you have, for example, if you have to locate the position of hydrogen atoms, it is very difficult. The reason is now should be clear to you because its atomic scattering factor is extremely weak. It has only one electron on its uh, nucleus. So it doesn't scatter electrons at all. So very difficult to locate its position. However, you use neutron scattering, which actually interacts with the nuclear magnetic moment. And therefore, the position of hydrogens can be located. So uh, I don't know if I'm answering your question, or uh, is it that what you wanted to know, generally the idea of structure determination? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Some of the high sir, some question. Anyone okay. give an intensity error or negative Gaussian profile uh, error? When I'm refraction the extra diffraction pattern? Negative. Sorry, I didn't get negative. Uh, anyone get on intensity error or negative profile? Gaussian profile like uh, uh, if error or highly can eliminate or solve? Uh, I am not able to follow exactly. You mean the intensity that the diffraction pattern is broad? Is negative, negative. 
Uh, negative will have practically no meaning. That usually comes due to experimental issues. For example, if you don't have a proper baseline, the negative intensities have really no meaning at all. It has no meaning because intensities have to be positive and real because only if it's a positive and real number you can work. Yeah, if it comes out as a negative a a diffraction yeah, pattern, yeah, maybe an experimental issue, maybe a baseline is not done properly or something. So Nirvan might know better. He has done a lot of crystal structures. Uh, yeah. So I think, uh, Jayanta, what you wanted to know probably, uh, the if intensities are very broad or maybe uh, if they are comes in the noise. So we have to eliminate the noise because that's very difficult to solve from that now. Huh. And the okay, yeah. Sorry, the, yeah, just the, width, the, the line width is very important. It yeah. contains very important information about the particle size. I skipped those, uh, those files. Uh, uh, it, it, it comes basically due to a finite size effect because if you have a finite number of Miller planes, the X-ray diffraction interference or the diffraction of waves interference is not complete. Therefore, you will see a little intensity away from the Bragg angle. That gives you line broadening. So that can be a big problem experimentally because it may hide an adjacent peak. So experimentally, there are a lot of issues which one has to tackle. You have to know which are the discrete lines which are coming from different planes, separate out the broadening effects, and uh, X-rays will have alpha and beta lines, slightly different wavelengths will come. So there are a lot of issues in the experimental part. Okay, I think uh, this is time uh, to now end of our program because it's too late. But obviously, I will encourage all my students uh, who have listened and gone through this uh, lecture and whatever the questions they have got it or uh, whatever the queries they have in, in their mind. So I'll uh, really encourage them to contact directly with the Professor T.P. Radhakrishnan in his email ID, which I'll share through the group. And uh, with that one, I'll also thanks once again because he's talking for more than one th hour, 30 minutes constant. Ah, that's okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, I just mentioned one more thing. I forgot to put that address. There is a website on which I have placed many of these PowerPoint files in public domain. Um, I I'll send it to uh, Sunil Ban. Uh, it is basically what I use for my teaching of chemistry of materials course. There is this whole PowerPoint presentation with several more slides than what I showed you. Uh, on X-ray diffraction, on nanomaterials, on thin films, and so on. So I will send that link to you, uh, Dr. Das, so you can send it to anybody who is interested, OK? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, and sure. one more thing, I will also let know the audience, because uh, our professor Radhakrishna has also expressed an, an, another very uh, important field, and that is uh, what he just mentioned, is the nano dimension. And it also relates with X-ray, uh, as he uh, just told that when the uh, peak broadening occurs, that peak broadening itself gives some idea about the crystalline uh, phase and also crystalline size. So in near future also, maybe I'll uh, also give a pain to our <laughs> Professor Radha Krishnan uh, for talking us about the nanocrystalline future sometime. <laughs> sure, sure. With that one, I once again, I thank him. Many, many thanks and my hearty welcome to him in uh, our student fraternity and he shared his thoughts, his uh, feelings and as well as his uh, expertise in this particular field. And it's really very difficult to say all these things and discuss these things within a very finite time like one and a half hour. But although he have tried a lot and I hope with me all of uh, our uh, participants have got the idea about the this uh, vast topics which can extend it to not only the chemistry but also physics and biological field so with that again uh, thank you sir thank you very much for yeah. giving us time okay thank let you. me also thank all of you for uh, spending this time in the evening yeah? late evening yes all the rest <laughs> to all of you yeah thank you thank you very much sir. thank you so, so i'll close now yeah yes sure okay bye 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 thank you so with that one, uh, we are ending this uh, our first lecture in this lecture series. And uh, tomorrow, by tomorrow or day after tomorrow, I'll also uh, give the notification of our second lecture. And I uh, tried to accumulate some different ideas and different topics in this lecture series. In our uh, next lecture series will be in the nano dimensions, particularly in the nanotechnology, because that is one of the very important. Uh, topics which is uh, going on in different fields including the chemistry, physics and biological part. So I will give the notification within a very short time.
and uh, one more things i will just request to all our participants that the participating uh, certificates will be given to all the participants at the end of all the lectures and there will be at least five lecture series so definitely you will get the participating uh, certificate but that will be the at the end of all our lecture series and you will receive the feedback form for every lecture after this one so maybe by tomorrow i will uh, put up the feedback form link to all of you but the certificate will be issued at the end of the lecture series so with that one i thanks to all of you for participating in this lecture series thank you very much and have a nice time bye